When you start studying ancient human history and the origins of humankind, and we in South Africa see ourselves as the experts in the origins of humankind because we tell the whole world that we live in the cradle of humankind. And when you, for those of you that have never been to South Africa, that's all you see everywhere you go, cradle of humankind, cradle of humankind. And, but what they do is they do, they cause a lot of confusion with these signs because they take you off to the wrong places. They take you off to Stagfontein Caves and to this wonderful sort of Disney world of cradle of humankind called Marupeng. It's beautifully put together, but they do cause a lot of confusion because they start showing you what, what is still regarded as the theory of evolution, and they sell it to you as fact. And I have a bit of a problem with that. But anyway, that's a, another presentation for another day. So when you start studying the origins of humankind and ancient human history and, and ancient civilizations, um, I'm sure many of you will be aware of this. It doesn't take long before you realize that something doesn't quite fit and some large pieces of the puzzle are missing. And, uh, and you've got to go outside of the establishment and the textbooks. You've got to go out to crazy places like this where you find the authors and the researchers that are writing and working outside of the established academic um, areas where you to find really some very interesting scientific research and information. And uh, it's really on that basis that many scholars and authors have been writing for decades, actually hundreds of years, and in fact, when you go a, a lot further back in time, for thousands of years, scholars and writers have been writing about this first and ancient civilization of humans that lived at the bottom tip of Africa, the southern tip of Africa. But all of this has been written about from extracts of ancient texts and scripts and Sumerian tablets and this and that and folklore. And, but very little physical evidence has ever been presented. And it's really this, our, our discoveries in South Africa of the last um, seven years and especially the last three years when I got involved with Jan Heine, um, when we started making these discoveries that pretty much blew our minds and forced us on a daily and weekly basis to reconsider everything we thought we knew about our human history. Um, the last email, for example, I got from Professor Paul Von Ward from Harvard University who sent me his amazing book, God's Genes and Consciousness, who writes extensively about this first civilization of advanced beings who lived at the southern tip of Africa. And so it goes, just to mention one. But what we do know is that the Sumerian tablets keep telling us some of these very important things. And it's up to us to decide if we're going to believe it or not. Now, I have no doubt whatsoever that the ancient civilizations had a lot better things to do than to sit and try and write down a bunch of bull to try and confuse future generations about what it is that they knew. Okay, And, and this is where I have a real problem with the sort of the... the uh, divided approach that some academics have. They'll tell us that we've learned everything we know today from the Sumerians, you know, archaeology, I mean, um, uh, agriculture, astronomy, um, architecture, medicine, law, etc. We pretty much got from the Sumerians, but when it comes to some of the more weird and esoteric stuff, say, oh no, they must have been drunk when they wrote that. <laughs> but, well, you know, you must decide. Do you believe this stuff or don't you? And I, I don't think we can have this divided approach to the ancient texts. Um, and these tablets tell us very clearly what was going on in ancient times, where the first people lived, what they did, why they did it, you know, who created them, where did they come from, and all these things. And it suddenly paints a completely different picture from what we find in our textbooks. And I must tell you, one of the most common emails I get from people from all over the world, and I'm talking hardcore academics, is, I love your work, I love your research, it's really wonderful, exciting stuff, but I can't support you on an official basis because I may, might lose my job. Now, that's not the kind of academic fraternity we'd like to see evolving around us. And I hope that as this information comes out, people start looking at this, especially from the academic world, with more serious, a more serious approach because it definitely deserves that. Just to show you some... Two beautiful example of, examples of Sumerian tablets. The one on the left is a Sumerian tablet, one of the king's lists that's been found. And this one talks about um, a time period of 212,000 years. Uh, it names the kings that ruled um, for eight 
eight kings had ruled before the flood over a period of 212,000 years. Now, these are periods that our archaeologists and historians just do not want to deal with. Okay, the more popular um, Sumerian king list is the one on the right. That goes even further. That names over 130 kings, uh, 10 of whom ruled before the flood over a period of 224,000 years. And we start seeing that these ancients had information that somehow was hidden or lost or consciously removed from our body of knowledge and information. And then we start finding the ancient ruins of southern Africa. Well, the current belief is that Southern Africa was a sparsely populated place with very few inhabitants before a thousand years ago. And the emphasis is on very few inhabitants. We're talking a few thousand. That's it. A bunch of hunter-gatherers that ran around, did nothing better to do than shoot some buck and, you know, make some biltong and, and you know, have a party. I don't know. Just somehow survive and make pictures on cave walls and things. And that's what we're told. Pick up the history books. That's what they'll tell you. Well, fortunately for us, the stone ruins of South Africa and Southern Africa tell us a completely different story. These um, stone structures that we've been discovering are often called cattle kraal, of little historic value. Once again, this is the most common reference you'll find in the history books and the academic books on these. And some of the references are so preposterous that you actually wonder how these people got their degrees. Um, I'm going to take you through some of them. And then the rest of it, uh, you can get in my new book, Temples of the African Gods, which tells you a, a lot more detail about what's really going on here. The one thing we need to embrace as well is that ancient civilizations had a body of knowledge and information that we've long lost. And we've got to stop assuming that we are the pinnacle of civilization because we've got cell phones. Okay, that does not constitute civilization. And there are ways and means of getting information across and sharing information using other types of technology that we don't quite understand. Well, the first thing you'll note about the stone ruins of Southern Africa is they're all circular. They're all circular. They all have internal structures, sometimes very complex, sometimes very simple. And sometimes they have these little weird attachments on the outside of the stone structures. But the most important thing to take note of is that they're all unique. Each and every one of them is completely unique. And in, my, in the longer presentations, I go into great detail why that is so. Some of the walls are still three meters high and two meters wide. Some of them are really complex. And you can see great destruction um, that happened at some distant time in history that caused the sudden disappearance of this vast civilization. Very importantly to note that some of them also, or many of them, show the sort of spiderweb effect that goes out from the central stone structure. And that's very important to note. It's not just the stone walls of the central structure that are so impressive. It's the stuff around it that's eroded and gone, that's disappeared, that's lying beneath meters of soil. There's a very good example of a very simple structure with a simple central structure. Um, circle, and then you start seeing the more complex ones. These weird little internal structures that are 1.2, 1 1.5 meters in diameter, absolutely no idea what they were used for. This is a very important stone, stone circle. It's one of the first ones that was measured and, and sort of um, uh, understood by Johann Heine who's uh, the main sort of instigator and the guy that kept um, insisting that these structures are not just cattle crawl, that they have a much larger importance in human history. Johann has actually originally started photographing many of these from the air about 20 years ago and was responsible for bringing this to the attention of the South African Archaeological Institution and so forth. And, and, uh, but he has just been completely ignored. And then you start seeing some really interesting um, interesting shapes, like on the left-hand side there, you can see that weird horseshoe shape with a perfect circle in the middle, and the little towers at the entrance to the horseshoe shape. And these suddenly start to re-emerge over and over again. Look again, once again, it's not just the main structure to look at, but it's the greater area around it that is gone and eroded. It looks like a very complex spider's web. There you see, this is some of the ruins that are in the sappy, the, the forestry areas. Thousands and thousands of ruins have been destroyed by the forestry 
um, industry, and some have been protected and remain, which is a good thing. Uh, it seems that SAPI has finally woken up and realized that they need to protect some of these ruins. And uh, we've started with the Makamati Foundation, which I'm a, a member of, um, that was started in 2003. We started protecting some of these ruins that fall in, in, the, into, in the SAPI areas. And <clears throat> there's another one of those horseshoe interesting shapes of the pillars. And this one is inside a much larger structure. And then you got a nice aerial view from the helicopter we took. If you look carefully on the left-hand side, uh, you'll notice that there were many more structures in between. It didn't end with this one in the foreground and that one over there. It, want, it once was a, uh, uh, an ongoing settlement of many, many more structures that just never ended. Very important thing to note, which you probably didn't notice, is there's no doors and entrances. This is one of the anomalies and the big mysteries that our archaeological friends, when they go and excavate these, uh, which is, hasn't really been happening on a large scale at all, one of the first things they always mention is there are no doors and no entrances, and this is a real mystery. What the hell were these things used for if there aren't any doors or entrances? And then we get to realize that we're dealing with what we now know, not just speculate on, we know this for a fact. This is the largest and most mysterious ancient stone settlement on earth and consists of dwellings, workplaces, places of worship, ancient roads. These roads run for thousands and thousands of kilometers and terraces, agricultural terraces that cover more than 450,000 square kilometers. This is not a quick something that you throw together while you're a hunter-gatherer or migrant laborer moving down from the north trying to find new pastures. This is a serious, ongoing engineering feat of proportions that we cannot find anywhere else in the world. As I said, the agri agricultural terraces run for thousands of kilometers. They seem to have been de de designed for crops and livestock. And then you've got to ask yourself, to feed how many people in this sparsely populated subcontinent? What the hell were all these thousands of kilometers of terraces all about? The numbers just do not make sense. There's just a few examples of some of these terraces. Um, this terrace, for example, was uh, an archaeological friend of mine at, um, at the University of Pretoria told me with absolute certainty, well, this is at least 5,000 years old, but probably a lot older, just studying the erosion patterns on this. And, uh, and he said, but if you quote me, I'll deny it. And I said, OK, I'll quote you, but I won't mention your name. <laughs> um, and then you start realizing, this is incidentally all near the area of Waterfallburfen, the town that I've now moved to and live and do all my research in, because most of the densely um, visible structures are there. So it's very easy to access, drive up the mountain in your 4 by 4 and spend you know, days and days there studying these things. Then you suddenly realize that the entire mountains are just a continuation of terraces, um, you know, interspaced with circles and roads and other strange, weird shapes that we haven't quite figured out. I'll go into a lot more detail again in the longer presentations. Here's a spectacular example of terraces, circles, and ancient roads running straight up the mountain all the way down to the river. And then pay attention to the bottom left-hand corner. That's what I call the strange hexagonal kind of beehive uh, honeycomb effect. That is a very, very important piece of the puzzle that we get into in great detail. This looks like you're somewhere in South America in Machu Picchu and not the hills of Waterfallburfen, South Africa. And we start to realize that something strange has been going on that we have absolutely no idea of. And then we get to the strange anomaly of these ancient roads, these thousands and thousands of miles. And I can tell you that every one of these stone circles in its original form was attached to one of these ancient roads. We originally called them roads. Later on, we now call them channels because we realized they weren't really roads. They were for something completely different. The most important thing to realize is that, that when these channels enter the stone circle, they, they are no doors and no entrances. So once again, it's this big mystery. What is this all about? And did you notice that spider's web effect again? All the way down. So you got this, this stone structure at the top of the hill, and all the way down the hill, you got the spider's web effect interspaced with other terraces and other stone circles, all connected. There you can see the road links from the top 
By the way, when you walk on, this, on these ruins, many of these ruins, you have no idea that you are standing in the middle of the ruins. You need to see it from the air to realize where you are, that you're actually standing in the, in the, among all these amazing structures. And there's a spectacular example. And this is also very, these set, set of photographs are also very important because they show the effect of water, large amounts of water that has caused a lot of damage to these. That's another thing we get into in great detail. But it's very important to, to, to look carefully at, at some of these photographs because we get some very important geological um, um, evidence of what happened here in the past, in the distant past. Another example of the road cutting through some terraces up the mountain, and so it goes. This is a beautiful effect. Just because you can't see ruins to the top and to the bottom of the road doesn't mean that they are not there. They are there in large numbers. They're just covered by meters of soil. And once again, on the left-hand side, you get that weird cluster of hexagonal shapes, hexagonal stone clusters, beehive effect. No way to get into the middle of them, but there they are, clustered together. Very strange things going on here. There's a beautiful example. Note, there's no doors or entrances. It's just this one continuous structure of stone. That's spectacular. Now imagine the entire Southern Africa looking something like this a long, long, long time ago. And that's pretty much what we're dealing with here. There's another one of those sets photographs where you can see the effects of water moving in one specific direction. What's it all about? Always about gold. That's one thing that you cannot separate from human history is gold. Man's obsession with gold, but even more importantly, man's God's obsession with gold. Every ancient civilization, whenever the colonialists arrived there and they found this abundance of gold, and they asked the locals, who does the gold belong to? What was the answer? Always the same answer. The gold belongs to the gods. Something weird was going on here. Wherever there are stone circles, there are gold mines. Oh, surprise, surprise. And uh, we have walked through hundreds of these ancient gold mines. I don't, hopefully you can see the stone circles there with terraces. There are at least eight circles there, beautiful terraces. Remember, a lot of soil covering the, these structures. You can hardly see them anymore. Just to show you some of these gold mines that you find right up the, the side of the mountain, into the sides of the mountains, there are hundreds, if not thousands of them. In one day, I probably walked through close to 100 of these mines. What's interesting about this, then in the, in the mid-1800s, when the gold rush happened in South Africa, these gold mines were all reopened by the gold explorers, and I believe that they weren't actually created as new mines. They just reopened these ancient mines that these ancient civilizations were mining a long, long time ago. <clears throat> and for those of you who like orbs, here's a nice picture for you. Just to show you that even the orbs are interested in the ancient cultures and our gold mining activities. And there's a spectacular shaft. It's um, strangely enough, we don't know how deep this is. It's at least 100 meters deep. I, I was very nervous sitting next to it there. On the right, you can see what it looks like from the air, and it goes all the way down. Uh, it's probably about five miles away from what is still the richest gold mine in the world today, Sheba Gold Mine. Do you think they knew something we don't? And then we find the brilliant Anne Kritzinger. The, she's, um, I think she's head of geology at Zimbabwe University. About three years ago or so, she wrote a spectacular paper. Remember, these ruins carry on right throughout South Africa, Zimbabwe, Botswana, and Mozambique, and across the Zambezi even further north. Until recently, because of the lack of information and research, these so-called um, circular structures in many of the Zimbabwe type ruins were called slave pits and animal pits and grain pits because that's the frame of reference. You know, they must have been slave pits. They must have been for animals or grain. Well, it's such a bunch of rubbish that you want to, it's laughable. So the brilliant Anne Kritzinger went and she wrote this amazing paper. She sh shows conclusively that these were flotation extraction tanks for gold. You can find her paper online and read through it. It is a wonderful read, a beautiful academic read, and I wish other academics will follow in her in her footsteps. And there's some interesting yields that she gets from some of these um, so-called animal pits and grain pits. Makes a good gold mine today. And then you realize that Great Zimbabwe is actually the grandest of them all. You realize that it's the same civilization. There's another aerial shot. 
and you realize that when they tell you Great Zimbabwe has been perfectly explored and excavated, they know everything about it, they're just lying through their teeth like they always do. Because you can clearly see the sediment there that has been touched. There's so much more work to be done there, except Great Zimbabwe is where the mine manager lived. Okay, once again, the Sumerian tablets tell us very clearly. I grew up in a gold mining town. You know, I know exactly where to find the mine manager when you arrive in a mine town. You just look on the big house on the hill, and that's where you find the mine manager. And nothing has changed. It's a great Zimbabwe. It's the mine manager's house. Very simple. It's the biggest and the grandest of them all. The first reference of uh, the Zimbabwe ruins and the Southern African ruins we get from about 1510. One Antonio Fernandez and a few of these cronies, they were known as the degradados, the unwashed the criminals that they took out of jail and sent them into darkest Africa to go and explore it. If they came back, everybody gets excited. If they didn't come back, they didn't really lose much sleep about it. And uh, fortunately, he came back with some amazing stories about these incredible ruins that were covered and overgrown. And he met these Karanga and Makalanga people who happened to be Children of the sun. We'll get more about that. And then in 1895, um, the brilliant Theodore Bent found these interesting inscriptions and letters on a rock in Botswana. Now, the reason I'm showing you this is because originally when Theodore Bent excavated Great Zimbabwe and wrote a brilliant book about it, that should be a, a, you know, a textbook in all schools and universities, but it's not. It's been hidden out of sight. There was a lintel above the main entrance of Great Zimbabwe. Guess what? It had an inscription on it. So we know that whoever built Great Zimbabwe had the knowledge of writing. That lintel is in somebody's private possession, and it's not really available for us to see. It could have been this kind of lettering. I'm not saying it is, but it may just have been this kind of thing. If we find that lintel, it'll be a great, great tool to try and unravel the mystery of these ancient civilizations. And then we start finding the interesting links to what we believe until recently to be the great northern ancient civilizations. Well, that's going to change for all of you as of right now because you're going to realize that all the great northern ancient civilizations got everything they know from what we now call the first people in southern Africa, long, long, long before Egypt ever saw the light of day, or the Sumerians, or the Indus Valley civilizations, or any of the Incas or the Mayas, or anything you've ever heard of. And this is a big aha moment. This is a big hurdle to cross for most people. This Phoenician constellation, beautifully depicted on a wooden bowl found near Great Zimbabwe by Theodore Bent. Roman coin from 138 AD, Antoninus Pius, found 25 meters deep in a gold mine in Zimbabwe. 300 BC Sumerian Babylonian coin found at the Marion Hill Monastery in KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa, when they were digging the foundations. This wonderful Egyptian headrest on the left, and the southern African headrest on the right. Interesting to note the um, architectural styles, the pillars of Egypt and the concentric circles of southern Africa. It's quite beautiful. And then suddenly when you take a closer look at the headrest from South Africa, you find a beautiful Maltese cross carved into this headrest. And you go, what the hell is a Maltese cross doing carved into a headrest in southern Africa? And then it gets even more interesting. If you thought the, the cross in a circle was something that came from the Near East and the Babylonian and the Sumerian cultures, we find thousands of them carved into one of the hardest rocks, andesite, diorite. This is a glaciated rock outside Kimberley, South Africa. I photographed thousands of these and many more spectacular um, carvings. What's interesting, this, this incidentally in African, ancient African Tradition means Mabona, Lord of Light. That's what this symbol means. And it gets even more interesting when we find the winged Sumerian winged disc engraved on, on rocks in southern Africa. And from the erosion on these rocks and the growth of the patina on this, we can establish that we're dealing with something that's way over 20, 30, 40, maybe even 50,000 years old. Great is the all-seeing Lord of the sky, Mabona. That's what this winged disc is all about. And then we start meeting the sun-worshipping cultures of southern Africa, which is not supposed to be there. The Makalanga, the children of the sun. And if you look at the erosion and the cracks that, have, that form through these carvings, through this andesite, very, very hard rock, you realize that this is not something that was carved 2,000 or 5,000 years ago, but a lot longer than that. And then the Holy of Holies, the Egyptian Ankh. 
There's a beautiful Egyptian ankh carved in a radiating circle in the same area, which tells us once again that these people had an advanced knowledge of radiant frequency, energy, etc. And again, I'll go into a lot more detail why I can say these things in, in the longer presentations. Um, we know that in Egyptology, the ankh was used as a healing tool and many other amazing things. And this suddenly becomes very evident when you start studying um, these ancient structures in Southern Africa. It's got a lot to do with vibrational frequency, harmonic frequency, and so forth. And then we discover one of the biggest mysteries in, in Southern Africa were the Zimbabwe birds. These birds on a pedestal. Um, now, in Egyptology, this, again, once again, the brilliant Theodore Bent showed us in 1895 that the, the bird on a pedestal from the zodiac of Dendera was, was also a representation of the goddess Hathor, who was, the, who was supposed to be the goddess of the gold mines and the protector of the gold mines. And many of the gold mines that he excavated in those days, he found these little carvings at the entrances to these gold mines as to protect the gold miners in Egypt and the Near East. Well, where were the first gold mines in the world? In Southern Africa. And suddenly we find that these mysterious Zimbabwean birds that no one has really had an idea what they were all about were actually the earliest and very, very much older mascots and protectors of these early gold miners in Southern Africa. And suddenly we start seeing this cohesive picture of these ancient civilizations, the gold mining operations, the big house on the hill. It all starts to fall into place. And then when I started discovering these stone circles uh, in the area that I live in, I started finding what we call the early prototypes, these basic broad bases, the narrow, narrow top. And I'm finding thousands of these all over the place. So they're obviously obsessed with this weird shape, carving it broad base, narrow top, many, many of these. Here's a picture taken very recently coming down the mountain. There's a beautifully carved stone. Uh, again, one of these, what we call Zimbabwe birds, I call them that, um, have very little idea why they were so important, but they clearly played a very important part in those ancient cultures. And then these birds become giant monoliths. Um, you can even see the wing that's been carved into it on the side there, where Nick is standing under it. And that's a close-up look of its head. It's standing at a weird angle, so you don't really get to appreciate it. And uh, then you've got to ask yourself, what is so special about all these ruins and there's all this weird stuff going on? Well, it seems to be that these turned out to be very special cattle kraal for very special cattle, obviously, because many of these stone structures show advanced knowledge of geometry and even sacred geometry and architecture and uh, some really interesting stuff that you don't just throw it together accidentally. And... It goes on and on and on. This one is my special favorite because this one starts to deal with shapes and structures that are very close to a lot of people's hearts and specifically the knowledge of sacred geometry. Remember that the word sacred means fixed geometry. It's got nothing to do with wishy-washy religion. It actually means fixed geometry as made by the divine being or the divine creator. And when you extrapolate, sorry, they are the, just the alignments to show you how these guys didn't mess around. But it gets even more mysterious. When you extrapolate that flat area of this particular circle into the circle, you get a perfect hexagon. And you see the beautiful triangle that touches the inner circle perfectly, and you start to realize that these guys understood the platonic shapes and the tetrahedron and the star tetrahedron and so forth. And you realize that they understood the fundamental principles of physics and all these kind of things that we only really recently started grappling with. And uh, those that study sacred geometry will recognize it as the fruit of life and so forth. And uh, we also suddenly realized that Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci knew exactly what he was talking about, except these guys were doing it 200,000 years ago already. Where's the flagship among all these ruins, you may ask? And the flagship is undoubtedly Adam's calendar. But before I get there, I'm going to tell you about the stones that ring like bells. And this is very important. You realize that those slides were swapped, right? <coughs> um, when we started clearing some of these sites, we started hearing these, these stones as we were lifting them and, and moving them that started ringing like bells. Now, normally when I do my tour around South Africa, I carry a few samples with me. 
And when I say they ring like bells, I mean they ring like bells. And uh, unfortunately, I couldn't bring a stone sample with me. I will be loading these on the website very soon to actually show you and so you can listen to it and really appreciate it. These guys are clearly working with sound, sound harmonics, harmonic frequency, and that's why these shapes and all these structures were very, very important. Um, discovering Adam's calendar, in 2003, Jan Heine accidentally stumbled upon this amazing calendar site. Um, these are the main calendar stones in the center of what was originally a circular structure. It's perfectly aligned with the cardinal points, north, south, east, west, solstices, equinoxes. That's what it looks like from the helicopter. Um, the tree on the right is north, the tree on the left is south, and you've got the two main calendar stones in the middle. North-south line cuts right through and in between the calendar, between the two main calendar stones. That's the view north, and you can see it goes right through the middle. And that's the view south, right through the middle. This was a stone man that in 1994 was removed, was the anchor point, was the pivotal point of Adam's calendar. It was removed for the simple reason that they wanted to put a plaque on it to commemorate the launch of the opening of the Blue Swallow Reserve. It's a great mystery, but they desecrated the holiest site on earth. By the way, Kredo Mutwa, the brilliant, wonderful South African shaman, Kredo Mutwa, many of you may be familiar with Kredo. Kredo calls this one of the two most sacred sites on earth. He says this is where heaven mated with Mother Earth. I'm not going to go into this uh, again, it's too, too, too much information, but it is a very, very important statement he made, and it took me at least a year to try and figure out, and eventually figuring out what the hell Credo meant when he said, this is where heaven mated with Mother Earth. And that is why, according to Credo, Adam's calendar, and then the Tzodilo Hills in northern Botswana, the, the serpent worship site in northern Botswana are the two most sacred sites on earth. That's the view that the stone man had before they removed him, looking at the spring equinox sunrise. Why is it a calendar? There's Jan Heiner, by the way, the guy that discovered it. Because the tall stone in the foreground casts a beautiful shadow on the calendar stone, and you can still tell the date and the time of the year accurately even today. We now believe that this calendar site is about 280,000 years old, a lot older than anyone's ever imagined. And there's a lot of things that point towards that. Once again, this doesn't take, this is not something that you just come up in a day or a week or a month. This, this has taken us seven years to reach these conclusions. And so every day of the, of the year, you can mark exactly what day of the year it is. It starts on the right-hand side with the winter solstice, and then the shadow moves across. When it reaches the left edge of the stone, it's the summer solstice. It stops, and it moves back again. And that's the Adam's calendar principle. There you got a 3D reconstruction of it. And you'll note on the eastern side, we've got the three stones and then the one stone that marks the eastern sunrise. I'll get back to it now. What else have we found? We found an ancient workshop, the oldest, oldest carved sphinx, the first Horus hawk, an ancient grave, which is very important, linking us to the Sumerians, the first pyramids ever built, and an obvious link to Orion. Ancient workshop here, you can see evidence of carving, Chipping and shaping, there are hundreds of these giant, um, these are dolerite monoliths that are brought from somewhere else, scattered right along the edge. Adam's calendar runs for about a two kilometer stretch. It's not like, you know, just one calendar site. There's a lot of activity that goes on right along the edge, all looking out towards the center of the impact crater, which is known as the Barberton Impact Crater. This is another stone man that we found, similar to, to the first stone man. He lying on his side right next to the, what we call the ritual path. Crater Mutwa talks about that ritual path very uh, passionately. He burst into tears when I showed this, this work to him the first time. And then exactly north of, of the center of Adam's calendar is this strange tree growing out perfectly on the horizon. And we thought, that can't be a coincidence. There's got to be something there. When we got there, we found this beautiful stone altar out of which the tree is growing. Well, that happens to be the grave of a very important ancient king. Crater Mutwa once again confirmed this for me, and since then we've done a lot more work on it with infrared photographer. We know there's something lying underneath. We need to get to digging. There's a, what we believe is to be probably the oldest sphinx. Remember this dolerite stone peels. It peels like an onion. And uh, when you stand closer to it, you see the, the peeling of, this, of these stones. I believe that these may have actually had facial features at some stage, 
but that's long gone. The dating of the stones is a tricky thing. It's not easy. That's why it's taken us a long time to come up with a, a figure of around 280,000 years. But I'd like to tell you, I'd like to start with the most mysterious one, the psychic revelations, because I often forget to get back there. And for people out there who still think that psychic, schmikic, mumbo jumbo, you need to wake up and start facing reality. Psychic ability is something that's been used by the secret military forces for decades, if not even longer. It is a well-accepted human ability, and we need to start treating it with the respect it deserves. But I'd like to take the psychic mumbo-jumbo and turn it into a scientific argument, and we can do that very quickly and very simply. Because if you have 12 or 20 psychics telling you a long list of exactly the same facts and information about this particular site, when some of them have never been there, some of them have never met, in fact, most of them have never met, and they tell you this long list of exactly the same bits of information, you can turn it on its head and say, what is the statistical probability that all these people can tell me all these things that are exactly the same, and you will find it several billion to one. So we know that, scientifically speaking, that what I'm telling you, there's a several billion probability to one chance that I'm lying to you. The geology of the place tells us that the monoliths don't belong there. They were brought from somewhere else. The Black Reef Quartzite versus Dolorite, you'll see the, the cliff edge. I mentioned to you the calendar overlooks the Barberton Valley, the impact crater. It's about almost a kilometer above the impact crater. Um, the Black Reef Quartzite is the name of the bedrock there. That's what they call it. It's also rich in gold in certain areas. While all the stones that you see of Adam's calendar, every single one of those stones on the edge is dolerite. It was brought from somewhere else. It does not belong there. It's not part of the bedrock. It's a different, completely different geology. The closest intrusive vein of dolerite is about a, at least a kilometer away, but we're not sure if that dolerite came from there yet. We know from lichen growth, this particular lichen on these rocks grows about one millimeter per annum. We have layer upon layer upon layer of lichen growth on these rocks, especially the one on the left, it'll take about 2,000 years for that rock to be covered in lichen. We have multiple layers that cover that. So we have multiple effects of 2,000 years here. Then look at the erosion, look at the edge on, the, on that rock that broke. The piece that broke off, fortunately for us, all the pieces are still in situ, so we, can, we got a lot to work with. Um, piece broke off, it's lying beneath it. The erosion on the piece that broke is at least a centimeter. Now, this is an interesting geological problem, but when you ask any geologist, how long will it take for this dolerite to erode a centimeter, they'll tell you, well, it's a long, long time. And he says that 100 years, no. Is it 1,000 years, no. Is it more than 50,000 years? So definitely more than 50,000 years. So this is what the kind of thing that we're dealing with. Okay, no one's bold enough to go out there and say, well, it's at least 300,000 years. So we're trying to do some, some simulated erosion tests on this dolerite, and uh, I've got some of the best uh, scientists in South Africa that are going to start doing that with me. Archaeoastronomy is really interesting. At first... You realize that Adam's calendar is a beautiful circle, as you can see, circular structure. But you see that the north-south is sitting off center. It's not sitting at 12 o'clock. And that was a big flag to us because we realized we're dealing with something that was created at a time when north-south was out of kilt with what it is today. And when you start getting involved in archaeoastronomy, it becomes a very tricky subject. And, and a lot of... I suppose arguments would, would arise out of this. So I'm going to keep this very short because there's a lot more work to be done here. But what we, when we measured it, we found that there's a deviation of three minutes, three degrees, 17 minutes and 42 seconds. Deviation of the current north, south, east, west alignment. Now that suggests to us that Adam's calendar was built when the current north, south, east, west was out of kilt with what it is today. Even in the, in the, in the processional wobble, of that, that, you know, we rounded off at 26,000 years. It all depends who you study and who you research. Um, even, even that, north and south remains true. It doesn't move from what it is. So it suggests to us that whenever this calendar was built, the earth was sitting at a different angle. And since then, it has moved into the current angle that it is today. And that is this big question that we're dealing with. Erosion is a very interesting one. Crater Mutwa tells me that this particular rock, which we call the skull, 
And as part of the initiation in 1937, he had to urinate on this rock. And that is why it eroded a lot more than all the others. Because it did really start to worry me. I thought, well, if this one has eroded so much, why did the others not erode all like this one? So it was a big relief for me to find that this is, you know, urine that caused the erosion and not just, you know, rain and, and wind. And then this here for me personally is really the big breakthrough. This is a, a monolith that I discovered, as you can see, it's inside in the middle of a, a stone ruin near Waterfallburfen where I live. It's still part of the stone structure. And you can see when this rock breaks. Incidentally, all the stone ruins that, I'm, that I've showed you right across southern Africa are made of the same stone. They're known as hornfells. The original structures are made from hornfells, the same stone, because of its audio properties. Its properties is 54% silica dioxide, about 28% aluminium, and the rest is iron. They ring like bells for that specific reason. And there's a very good reason why all these stone ruins are built out of the same stone, not just any rock lying around. They went to great lengths to find this rock and bring it to these tops of the mountains and all over, as you saw. This particular patina, very little is known about patina growth. Patina is the skin of the rock. You could call it the skin of the rock when the rock breaks, the raw, surf, the raw surface breaks open. You can see the raw surface on the inside. This particular rock is very dark. It's like black color, very homogenous. It's a metamorphosized quartzite. And then this patina starts to grow back. Well, the best information we have on this particular patina here is that it grows at about 5,000 years per first microscopic layer. Now, when you find a monolith that's embedded in the wall that's broken off and the patina has grown back by about two millimeters, we have a big aha moment. It's not just a few hundred or a few thousand years. We're dealing with hundred thousand, hundreds of thousands of years. Sterile alignment. Ancient civilizations were obsessed with Orion. You all know these. You know these. Chinese pyramids. Some of you may not have seen this before. There are at least 100 pyramids in China, probably a lot more. Orion seems to play a very important part in all of ancient culture, together with some of the other alignments like Pleiades and Sirius. So we thought to ourselves, well, Adam's calendar is special. It's better. It's older. We should also have an Orion's alignment. And yeah, of course we did. So we went and looked at those stones. It's so obvious lying on the side. You can see that at one stage it was standing up. You could see from the satellite shot it used to be a circle. So let's lift those stones up and see what happens. So we lift them up and see that there's definitely an, an alignment. But you've got to go back a long time. And once again, we've got this weird three and a quarter degree displacement. So we've got to start bringing that into play. And this causes a lot of confusion. So I've spoken to a lot of astronomers and, archaeo and wannabe archaeoastronomers and, and physicists about this and trying to figure this out. We're going to get to the bottom of this. But at this stage, it's all pointing that it's way beyond 200,000 years when that kind of alignment would have taken place. And not many people can figure things out that far back. Could there be a guardian bird at Adam's calendar? And the one stone that we missed out. I'll never forget the day that we went there. That wonderful stone lying under that tree on the edge. And I went there with a guy called Fred, and we, what, we scraped away the soil that was covering the bottom tip of the, of the stone, and guess what we found? A beautifully carved bird head. We believe this is now the oldest Horus hawk head. Call it what you want. It's a bird. And, uh, and that is just another angle. It's got a beautiful fat belly. You can't see it from the parallax error here, this angle. But it's got a beautiful fat belly. The nose is broken off, and when you lift it up, there you got you got your Horus meeting the sun on the spring equinox in the southern hemisphere, right next to the three Orion's belt stones, and you have a very good indication of what we're dealing with here. Something that is so old that it's going to take us quite a long time to really figure it out. This is definitely the flagship in among all these ancient ruins. Seven years after Jan Heine started photographing and measuring Adam's calendar. This is a picture taken in 2003. Little did we realize that there were actually pyramids in the valley. <clears throat> and when you look at those pyramids, they also beautifully aligned with the rise of Orion's belt. There are actually three of them. The third one you can't see, it's too small. It's exactly the same as the Giza pyramids and those Chinese pyramids you saw. Two big ones, one small one. So we thought to ourselves, well, there must be a way that for us to determine whether these are pyramids or just mounds, you know. And uh, so we thought, what was the one thing that the ancients did or built 
to give us some more certainty. Well, we knew and we know that they built everything with specific purpose and everything was aligned with the flow of energy, with the golden mean ratio and the spirals and all things. They did all these things. They planned it really perfectly and they didn't make mistakes. That three and a quarter degree thing is not a mistake. It's just our inability to figure things out yet. So we thought, well, there must be a meaning, a way to figure out. So we drew a golden mean spiral and bingo, it goes right from Adam's calendar to the ancient grave and it lands right between the pyramids, so we realize that there's definitely something there. Um, <clears throat> and not just a coincidence. And then when you draw a line between Adam's calendar pyramids, Great Zimbabwe, and the Great Pyramid of Giza, you see a perfectly straight line. Incidentally, if I'm not mistaken, it also goes right through Napta Playa. And um, they're all along the 31 degree east longitudinal line. And uh, they are slightly offset there in a perfect line, though, which suggests that this crustal shift thing may have also played a part in ancient human history. Some more mysteries that I want to share with you before I finish. This is what I call the oldest statue on Earth, one of the many awesome artifacts that I've found um, through my exploits going through the ruins. I've built a little museum at Waterfall Burfen by the river where I've put together what I believe is probably some of the most precious human artifacts we have anywhere on Earth in a little museum quarter the size of this room. But they're really spectacular, new kinds of stone tools, a whole new class of stone tools that has not even been recognized by the archaeological fraternity, all kinds of weird shapes. Again, we look at the patina on this. Somebody carved this little statue a long time ago. The regrowth of the patina tells us that this has not just recently been carved. Okay? And if you want to know how big the giants were, the Anakim, or the Anunnaki, call them what you want. The biblical giants is a good example for you. This is one of the most amazing footprints we have on earth. This is not too far from where I live. This is obviously a lot older. This has got nothing to do with what we're talking about, but I just thought I'd throw it in there for some spectator value. <laughs> What's interesting about this is where my hand is resting. You know when you step into mud and you pull your foot out? And it pulls up that sort of piece of mud by your toe. Well, that's exactly what you got there. It's quite, it's like you stand there and you look at this, you go, what the hell is going on here? It's like there's this piece of wet rock that this foot pulled up with it, you know. It's, un it's just absolutely mind-blowing stuff. But now you've got to realize that these were not just the first architects and engineers. They carved these things into rock. I've photographed hundreds of these petroglyphs of these stone circles. This one is specific interest because it's got this beautiful crack through it. And when you look at the erosion on the crack, once again, the geologists tell us, well, geez, I mean, this is going to be 100,000 years old at least. The, this stuff, that crack is not just going to erode the way that when you measure the erosion on this, this is really old stuff. So these are the circumstantial things we look at when we try and date this. I normally fool people. I say, no, we just carbon date the rock. Sometimes I don't get that. <laughs> and then the archaeologists all do us a great favor. And those of you that are come, going to come to my presentation on Tuesday, we're going to get into this in great detail, dealing with the harmonic resonant frequencies and the energy generating devices, because as you can imagine right now, this is where it's going. The archaeologists go and they do a detailed report of these ruins, and this is what they come back with. Well, I don't know if you can see what I can see, but I clearly don't see as a human settlement here. I see something completely different. There's no entrances. Every single one of these stone circles is linked by this weird wire or a road or a channel. And some of them are not just single walls. They've got amplification chambers around them. In the 40s, the Japanese devised what they called the death ray. They were going to smite the Allied armies with it. Unfortunately, they got nuked before they could use it. But what the death ray used was what's referred to as the magnetron. We use it in laser beams and our microwaves in our houses. It's a high energy generating device. It's a very lethal bit of apparatus. That's why they put that weird mesh stuff in front of your microwave. Otherwise, it would fly, fry you. This is what the magnetron looks like. It's called a high frequency, high energy generator. Okay? And then we suddenly start seeing the many, many hundreds and thousands of shapes of many of these ancient stone circles. And you realize that these guys are doing stuff that we can't even begin to imagine. Now imagine when a six inch diameter magnetron could smite the Allied army 
what a 22 meter diameter magnetron could do as an energy, energy generating device. And if you want to ask me, like many people do, well, if they were so advanced, why don't we see signs of advanced technology? Well, what we've decided is that the Stone Age was the age of advanced technology. They used the raw materials in the stone, just like the pharmaceutical industry should use the raw materials in the natural plants instead of extracting the active ingredient. The quartz, the metals, the gold, the iron is stronger and more active in its natural form in the rock. If you know how to use it, you'll know how to apply it. So how many of these stone circles are there? And this is the really big aha moment. In 1891, Theodore Bent estimated that there were about 4,000 of these. Remember, he traveled throughout Southern Africa in, uh, greatly and uh, first guy to really excavate Great Zimbabwe. 4,000 of these. By 1974, Roger Summers wrote uh, three or four books on the ruins of Southern Africa, and he estimated, beautiful calculation, 20,000 stone ruins. By then, I was so impressed because in a sparsely populated subcontinent, 20,000 stone structures is like, you know, each one of the people living there built himself five stone structures. That's really <laughs> impressive. They got nothing better to do. <laughs> and, uh, and then I got involved in 2007, and very quickly, after walking up and down many of the mountains and seeing literally thousands of, of these stone ruins, I, I guessed that there were at least 100,000 of these. I called the ex-head of archaeology at Wits University, Revel Mason, and I said, Revel, how many of these stone circles do you think they were? Because he did, did a lot of work on this in the 80s. And he said to me instantly, off the top of his head, he said, oh, at least 100,000. I said, that's fantastic, because that's what I think, at least 100,000. And I said, but that means that there must have been millions of people living here. And he went, well, then they couldn't have been 100,000. That's it, case closed. <laughs> you see what happens here is because we allow our current perception of what we think the world is and our history was to rule the way our, we structure our thoughts and the take out and the analysis and the conclusions we make. We don't do what the CSI guys do and I want to be like the CSI guys. I want to follow the clues and reach my conclusions based on the clues that I find. And that's what I like to say to people is just follow the clues. Don't just believe the textbooks because they speak from a very narrow base of knowledge and information. So by the time I finished counting, I realized that I needed to count these before I released this latest book because otherwise I'm just sucking thumb like everybody else. So I used the latest technology, which is obviously satellite technology. And can you see that? You see them down there? And I started counting. I broke it up into these interesting squares. And remember that you can only start counting these on Google once you've walked the mountains, once you know what the terrain looks like, so that you can recognize it from the air. So you can't do this just by looking at Google and say, well, there's nothing there. Once you know where you've been, and you can then say, ah, oh, that's what it looks like from the air. You can say, ah, oh, see, there are ruins over there, and they disappear under the trees, but they come out the other side of the trees over there. So I know they continue under the trees. So you can start extrapolating these things, because, but only once you've walked the ground. Okay, so I started counting. And you start realizing that this thing is a lot bigger than you ever imagined. And this is all over, from the from the eastern coast of South Africa, right through South Africa, into Botswana, right through Zimbabwe, I found what I call three ancient cities, one near Wartfalburfen, where I live, one near Rustenburg, which includes Sun City. They built the palace of the lost city on this ancient civilization. They're not even aware of this. And, um, and then in Zimbabwe, Great Zimbabwe, and all the, the major area around it. And, um, and it just goes on and on and on and on. But those three lost cities that I've found, this is the one outside of Rustenburg. It's really, really dense. And where there are trees, it continues. It does not stop. And remember, once again, all the same stone, all the same hornfells. They ring like bells. By the time I finished counting, there were at least 10 million stone ruins. So... Whatever that may mean to you, it means that we know nothing about our human history and we need to start from scratch. <laughs> There's a vanished civilization at the tip of southern Africa. We call them the first people. 
the South African wise men, the Sangomas, the shamans like Kredo Mutwa and many others like him know about this. They've known about it. They've been speaking about this for decades and they've often been made, been made laughing stocks. Well, I hope that this is going to start vindicating their wisdom and start focusing a lot more attention to this vanished civilization that we know absolutely nothing about. The first gold miners on earth and the progenitors to each and every one of us in this room. Thanks very much for coming. Thank you.